Welcome everybody to our weekly theoretical physics colloquium at Arizona State University. I will be running this for the next at least couple of months for sure. I have already speakers uh, lined up for at least uh, end of April. So welcome. Today we will have the presentation by uh, Mauricio, Mauricio Martinez Guerrero, who yes, is a postdoctoral researcher at North Carolina State University. He got his PhD degree at Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany in 2010. He had several prior to this. He spent a couple of years at the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain and then a couple of years with Ulrich Heinz at the Ohio State University. And finally, uh, he is now at uh, North Carolina State University. He has uh, worked recently a lot on hydrodynamics in applications to heavy ion collisions, uh, conditions far away from equilibrium. And he will be sharing a lot of interesting information today with us about this uh, field of research in a colloquium style presentation. Uh, welcome, Mauricio, and I'll give the microphone to you now. Thank you very much. Uh, everybody hears me? Yeah. I suppose so. Uh, okay, thanks, Igor, for the kind invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and today I will discuss a subject that um, has been ongoing for a while in theoretical physics in general. Uh, and this uh, subject is related with something that we call these days hydrodynamization and attractors. So in order to start, so just uh, let me uh, address a very generic question that appears in um, theoretical physics in different fields, which is consider a system which uh, initially is prepared far from equilibrium, whatever that means at this point, and then something happens, and then you get to something in equilibrium. So like in the figure that I'm showing here, um, I don't know, uh, so it is, for instance, when you have here the water flowing from the waterfall, and then after it falls, it just comes down and looks more relaxed where you can swim. And that is what I mean, like uh, close to equilibrium. So similar in physics, you have this type of, uh, situations that uh, you would like to um, understand better. And since this is a subject that, as I said, has been for a while in physics, I would refer mostly to something that has called the attention in recent years, which is the transitions towards uh, hydrodynamics, when the final state is described by hydrodynamics. Something is going on here with my pointer. Oh, okay, all right. The transition towards hydrodynamics. And uh, I will more precisely refer in this talk, something that is more related with attractors in kinetic theory and fluid dynamics out of equilibrium. So um, I, will left, I will leave out on purpose different aspects that enter here in this um, um, type of uh, transition from a far from equilibrium state towards hydrodynamics. And the reason is that uh, there has been a lot of uh, work about uh, attractors in hydrodynamics and more precisely kinetic theory. In the last four or five years, there are more than, I counted like more than 50 page papers at this point. So that's why I'm going to focus mostly in those developments and trying to flush out. Um, the more generic aspects. And also, um, even though some of the, I am gonna say attractors in kinetic theory, I will briefly discuss that those ideas started mostly also in uh, the context of ads cft correspondence uh, by the work of Heller and Spalinski. So uh, I will not really go into full detail of uh, all of that. I am not expert in ads cft but I'm gonna indicate uh, that there are some generic ideas that emerge in both, in both fields, despite the fact that I'm in um, 
current and different situations in one with the strongly coupling and another one with the uh, weakly coupling. Okay, so with this being said, let me just remind you why we are interested into this transition where I, when I go to hydrodynamics. And in order to do that, just let us recall that um, hydrodynamics is a theory that appears in different contexts and in different systems. And one of them is in liquids like we see every day, like water, ketchup, olive oil, and the favorite drink of physicists, coffee. But in recent years, also it was discovered that other type of physical systems that in principle do not have to behave like um, a fluid, uh, they indeed present a behavior like a fluid. And one of them was uh, quark gluon plasma that uh, last week in the last uh, seminar, Jackie Noronha Hostler explained us plenty about that. And this system is created at the temperature of the 10 to the 12 Kelvin, which is like millions of millions of orders of magnitude above the temperature at the center of the sun, which is very, very hot. And another system, which happens at temperatures that are millions of million colder than the usual ice that you have in your fridge, which is ultra cold atom system. And despite the fact that both of them uh, appear in different uh, situations, they share universal properties. And they share also similar physical problems. And I will refer about a little bit. So, what is the success of hydrodynamics, for instance, in uh, heavy ion collision? So here I'm showing one of the uh, most well-known uh, results from Weller and Romachke in 2017, uh, where they uh, calculate uh, the multiplicity coefficients, the Vn's that appear in this equation. I'm sorry that I cannot use the pointer from resource that I do not understand. Uh, okay. I'm going to illustrate the equation. Uh, and this is the distribution of particles that uh, is calculated by theoretical uh, means using different models. And one of them is hydrodynamical models. And we focus precisely in the Vn, which is a coefficient, a Fourier coefficient of that de angular decomposition, which is nothing else than the multiplicity of particles as a function of the angle. You do a Fourier decomposition and you analyze the behavior of those Vn. And in the plot, I show precisely those Vn as a function of the transverse momenta. And each N has a physical meaning, which is related with uh, information of the spatial geometry of the collision. For instance, in the plots in the left, you see different kind of uh, uh, contour plots of uh, the uh, matter deposit after a collision between two nuclei of very high energy. And each of them represent a different event and therefore a different geometry. And some of those geometries can have an ellipsoidal shape, which is uh, the so-called elliptic flow, the n equal to. If uh, it looks like more like a triangle, then it's n equal three, b three, and so on. So b four, b five, etc. And what the plot shows is precisely that if you perform calculations for lead-lead collisions at a center of mass energy of five point TV, uh, you see that there is a very, very good agreement up to some, uh, in some range of momenta, in the predictions made by hydrodynamics. And so far, it's one of the best models that we have to understand all those behavior of all those BN. Okay, so, and therefore, it's, it's a successful theory that tells us quite a lot about uh, something that is very complicated, like those collisions that we create in experiments on Earth. On the other hand, there is also another system that is called atom systems, where they trap atoms at very, very, very low temperatures using some particular technologies that uh, I'm not going to discuss. And in the upper part of the figure, I am just showing like what happens, and those are real experiments, those are photographies that they reconstruct uh, by different techniques, about how uh, when, once you have trapped the atoms and you release them, how this system starts to expand. What is interesting is that this expansion 
uh, can be measured by measuring the typical uh, transverse and longitudinal distance as a function of time. Uh, and then they measure the ratio and they compare with predictions made by uh, experiment, uh, simulations based in hydrodynamical models. And they also are able to show how to, uh, to predict uh, roughly uh, the experimental data that I show in the figure for different energies, uh, and each line represents a different energy, ener uh, Fermi energy, of the total gas of the system. And what is really interesting is that, again, hydrodynamics is able to uh, make valuable um, predictions that can be corroborated by experiments, and in both cases, it works. And this is surprising again, because uh, you do not expect that something as simple as hydrodynamics, as we know that, is um, making such a predictions in different uh, in systems of different scales. So what is the issue that um, make us uh, be successful, but at the same time worried? And there is a small paradox here, not a small, but a kind of complicated paradox. One of them is uh, precisely that if you perform simulations uh, in heavy ion collisions, which is precisely what I show in the left panel, this uh, is just uh, the evolution of the pressure anisotropies as a function of the in, 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 uh, as a function of the transverse plane in, in the sorry in the transverse plane y and x, and there is a distribution of of, of that uh, particular uh, observable uh, as a, at a given time. And you see that uh, depending on the color, then is uh, the darker it is, the, then the, uh, the smaller is this ratio, and the larger it is, um, the closest to one, sorry, uh, then the closest to equilibrium it is. So you see that there is a large variation in this particular distribution. And you observed also in the right hand side something that happens in coal atoms, where uh, the typical ratios of the sizes of those uh, atomic cl clouds are very, 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 very um, elongated, which means that the pressures are not going to be necessarily the same in the, in the radial and the longitudinal direction too. And however, and here is the paradox, that even though there are long pressures and isotropies in this system, hydro still works. And this is uh, a little bit strange because if you open any textbook, you find out that uh, hydrodynamic works as far as there is a hierarchy of the scales, which is uh, determined by the knots and number, which is just nothing else than a measurement of uh, some microscopic scale over some uh, macroscopic scale. For instance, the microscopic scale can be the mean free path, and the macroscopic scale is the size of this system. To give you an idea, about what this means, imagine that you have a ball inside the water, and then you just compare the size of the ball with, sorry, in size of, uh, a ball inside a pool, and then you just uh, are just measuring the size of your ball inside the pool. So that is kind of the picture that I am trying to uh, address about what the nonsense number tells you. And this number, if uh, hydro works, has to be very small, but we see that those pressure and isotropies are measuring large deviations and therefore should not work but it does. And so what happens with hydro? Or how, it, how hydro emerges? So hydro is considered these days an effective theory, which comes from some coarse grain procedure that reduces the number of degrees of freedom. What do I mean by this? Like if you, we know nowadays in the, life, in the, right, in the left hand side that the um, matter is formed of atoms and molecules, which have, have uh, very, very, uh, they are very deep inside matter. And when they are a lot together, when the number of particles is of the order of 10 to the 23, and you want to describe the dynamics of that system, it's pr practically impossible because of the impossibility to determine the dynamics of all those systems. But imagine that you start to like kind of uh, forget about those microscopic details and you start to change the scale of your uh, microscope, let's say, and then you start to change it, and then you start to see like the more uh, 
you uh, reduce uh, the precision of your microscope, you start to lose sight of the microscopic details until you see that the system behave like uh, many, many, many little balls together, which are compact, which are uh, completely uh, packed uh, in a unit cell of volume. And when you have this particular case that you just refine your microscope like that, then you realize like, oh, I can see some sort of collective motion of all the system. And I can describe the collective motion of all the system by a very few variables, like the temperature, the chemical potential. If you have just one particle species, if you have many, then there will be, each of them will have a corresponding chemical potential, the energy density of the system, the density, and the pressure. And this is very beautiful because uh, there is a economy in the number of degrees of freedom. So it's easier to have, relatively easier, to have control over a very, very, very few degrees of freedom compared with if I have 10 to the 23. So <laughs> however, how does the hydrodynamical limit emerges from an underlying microscopic theory. So how can we go from some the 10 to the 23 to the continuum? And this is a generic question that appears in certain regimes, in certain limits. And today I'm gonna just address one case uh, in order to illustrate the recent developments that have been done in um, recent years in our field, especially. And uh, this uh, framework is going to be uh, the Boltzmann equation where uh, the Boltzmann equation is nothing else than a description of a many-body system, which is uh, described by a simple uh, distribution function that has a, that is a function of the positions of the particles and the momentum. And what basically tells you is that if you have at a given time in uh, a density of uh, possible states of the system, and it changes as a function of time to, uh, to another type of shape of the density of the states of the system, there is a way to know the evolution of that particular uh, this, uh, density of a space. And this equation was derived 100, more than 100 years ago by Boltzmann himself. And it's the question that I have uh, there in the uh, upper part of the, of the uh, slide. And uh, the question can be just understood in different ways. There is a diffusion term that tells you how, part, uh, how the density changes from one to point without knowing about any type of interactions. There is another type of term that when you have external forces like electric fields or gravity or so on, uh, which uh, tells me about uh, the existence of some external forces. And there is another term that is very interesting because it's the particle imbalance, which tells me how many particles I lose or I gain after something happens with my uh, possible collisions that can appear between particles in the system. And diagrammatically, you see that um, in one case, like for instance, when you have the particle with momentum P, you lose it, and then you just uh, also subtract how many you can gain. And this is precisely the, uh, idea behind the collisional kernel that is called this C of E, F, that carries out that microscopic information. So with this being said, then how does uh, hydrodynamic emerge? So usually when you are uh, expanding uh, or trying to find solutions of this Boltzmann equation, it's very difficult. So when usual and practice practical uh, method is the Chapman Enskog expansion, which consists into expanding in small knots and numbers that are those uh, Kn to the K, so it's a power uh, series, which is asymptotic, again, I, I repeat, times some distribution function, uh, so times some little uh, function that depends again on the positions and momentum. And quantities that are macroscopic that are gonna be related with um, energy density or uh, dissipative corrections like the shear viscous tensor that we hear very frequently is uh, precisely uh, an integral or an average over the momenta of that particular distribution function. 
in such a way that uh, if you just simply replace that distribution function into the integral, you just find out that the energy momentum term is just, again, a, a serious expansion in the Knudsen number to the order k times some little function that I am calling, I am calling here t nu mu sub k. What is the physical meaning? Again, so if I am just fixing uh, what happens at the nonsense number to order zero, then I get the ideal fluid behavior where uh, I have this expression here where epsilon is the energy, P is the pressure that depends explicitly in the energy via the equation of a state, U is the fluid velocity, and when you are expanding in curvilinear coordinates in general, uh, I have uh, the metric there. If you are in uh, General relativity, for instance, this is very, very important for the studies associated with neutron star mergers. So you have to also couple this uh, fluid type of um, structure to the Einstein equations. And the correction to order one just give me uh, what we know these days, like the navier stokes tensor, where eta is just nothing else than the response of the system against the perturbation deviating from equilibrium at that particular uh, order. And if I continue going to second order in relativistic fluids, I have um, that those are uh, give rise to some theories that, I'm, that we know as Israel Stuart theories. And the interesting aspects of the Israel Stuart theories is that uh, we have been studying them since uh, given the impact that we have had in heavy ion collisions and we need them uh, from a certain perspective in order to uh, cure causality, although these days this has been uh, questioned a little bit. I'm not going to comment on that, but I'm just uh, pointing out that it's an important issue that is always discussed and it's interesting by itself. So given this uh, situation, let me just start to uh, flash out to some result that was very interesting which is related with the fact that uh, the Knudsen number can be very large in general. And here I'm showing a very, very nice picture of what happens with a uh, 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 gas that is just uh, being expelled from some uh, source. And it, it diffuses in, in the air. And in the right-hand side, you see that almost all the, uh, flow of this gas is laminar, so most of the particles are moving uniformly uh, with certain uh, deviation a little bit, but not so much. But as uh, you go more towards the right of the figure, you observe uh, that uh, there are like some eddies, and therefore there are some, uh, the, the, the gas becomes turbulent. And this is related with the fact that now the gas can expand in a different uh, volume before it was confined to a tube, and then now it's not. And if I just uh, try to evaluate what is the not a number in the case of uh, where I have a turbulent case, uh, I found that this not a number is not a small no object, it's on the order one. And therefore, those are situations where uh, one can question whether or not uh, you can use hydrodynamics. So, this is precisely the case of what we are observing. Uh, in collaton systems and also in heavy ions that the Knudsen number can be large and I showed before that there are some situations even in the models that we use to describe the experiments where this is happening. And again, you question yourself, well, what is the meaning of having hydrodynamics uh, when the system is evolving very, very, very fast? And one of the first results that really start to show certain generic aspects of what's really going on was without a doubt the work of Heller and Espalinsky in 2015, just uh, almost five years ago. And what they found out is like, well, suppose that I forget about uh, what happens uh, when I solve uh, by using multiple different initial conditions, which are the lines that you see in blue, and that f that appears in the vertical axis is nothing else than a function that depends on the shear viscous tensor. In this case, it's a very particular model that is one dimensional and over the energy. And in the right hand side, in the horizontal axis, you see 
uh, w, a, a, a variable w, that uh, is nothing else than the product of uh, the time times the temperature, which is in this particular model, uh, inversionally proportional to the uh, Knudsen number. So when the Knudsen number uh, is close to zero, then this w goes to infinity. Uh, and that is the region where the system is close to equilibrium. When uh, the, not the w going to zero is, uh, when w goes to zero, then the Knudsen number is very large. So here, uh, keep that in mind. And what it was found precisely in this particular study was that uh, Israel Stuart theory, if you solve it by using different initial conditions, uh, you have that all the lines forget about those initial conditions and they start to merge, no matter what you do, towards one unique line. And this unique line represents that there is a certain universality that is independent of the initial condition. And notice that uh, um, if you perf if you also uh, show, extrapolate what happens from W going to infinity until W going to zero, you find out that uh, there is like a, a unique line that attracts the rest of the initial condition. And the only difference is that certain amplitude, certain initial conditions will be arrive later because of the initial amplitude or something like that, but some others arrive earlier. Doesn't matter what, what is the reason, but at least it is just a unique line. And this aspect is very, very interesting because uh, in principle, you always know that differential equations, when you solve them, they have uh, some asymptotic behavior and hydrodynamics is no exception to that. And what is also interesting of this of the result, which I would like to summarize in the next slide, is the fact that, and let me just consider a very simple initial condition here. So again, I'm showing the same plot. Now I am using a slightly different variable, this pi bar, which is nothing else than uh, the uh, pressure and isotropy, a scale over the energy. And again, it's a asymptotic series, which is coming from the asymptotic expansion that I proposed previously which is, uh, again, as a uh, asymptotic expansion in the Knudsen number. And if you are really um, perform this type of uh, asymptotic naive expansion and you compare with the uh, exact solutions, uh, well, you start to observe that the late time behavior of any, any uh, initial condition that you have uh, is well described by those um, particular uh, asymptotic expansion. So it's okay, um, but you observe that uh, the, the further you are away from, um, sorry, the, the closer you are to this variable w going to zero, uh, you start to see larger deviations between your asymptotic expansions and uh, a particular given uh, solution, which in this case I took uh, arbitrarily. But the interesting aspect is what happens in the center when the Knudsen number is on the order one, that you see that uh, the two lines, the, either the first or second order uh, theory, start to merge with uh, a solution of the differential equations. And it happens precisely when the Knudsen number is extremely large. And this is has already, you could just start to imagine like, but before you were telling us, that I need not some number to be very, very, very uh, small in order to hydrodynamics to work. But here I'm showing that actually it's the opposite. Like, no, there is no problem with that. So one of the consequences will be like perhaps our idea of expanding in a small knots and number is very restrictive for the validity of hydrodynamics. That was one of the first messages that uh, many of us understood back in the day. Now, if you try to even understand a little bit further what happens uh, with this particular asymptotic expansion, and by that I mean like just replace naively in the particular differential equation that determines the evolution of uh, the pressure and isotropy, you will find out uh, very quickly that uh, the coefficient S sub k 
grows uh, factorially. And therefore, that perturbative expan asymptotic expansion it's, uh, it's very naive and is even worse that is divergent because uh, if you compare the ratio of the uh, k plus one when k goes to, uh, uh, over, a, so over the k uh, term, uh, you will find out that those, this term diverges. And this is again shocking because you always believe that, uh, well, at least you assume that that series was well behaved, it's not. Uh, I would like to point you out that I'm always focusing in the work of Heller and Spalinski in a system that is expanding. Uh, and this was precisely what uh, create a lot of uh, conflict for many of us to understand why. And the other aspect that Heller and Spalinski show is that there is a way to understand better the convergence of, uh, the, to understand better this type of uh, situations, if one uses some new concepts that emerge uh, by analyzing the behavior of the differential equations. Uh, and when you really start from an asymptotic expansion, it is already giving you enough information about what's going on uh, from late time to, early, to very, very early time. And in this particular case is that the, the, the naive series expansion is really part of a more generic series, which is called trans series, where each term is a series by itself. And what is really interesting there is the emergence of three particular aspects of that series. One is precisely what I uh, have uh, in the uh, blue box, which is those exponentially suppressed terms which grow like e to the minus s uh, over the Knudsen number. And for all of you who remember like your uh, basic classes of uh, quantum mechanics, you will find out that, or sorry, quantum field theory, you will find out that that reminds you something like the instantons because when the Knudsen number goes to zero, the Knudsen number play a role like the coupling constant. And when the Knudsen number goes to zero, then that exponential term is suppressed times uh, the knots and number to the beta, where beta is some particular arbitrary number that depends on the particular uh, model that you are using. And what is really interesting is that if you now compare again, what happens when you add those sums that emerge asymptotically after you resume them, then you find out that uh, there, uh, there is a very good agreement between uh, the exact solutions that you have there and the new resumed ones, compared with the asymptotics. But there is also something very interesting, which is that the asymptotic behavior of all those functions that emerges now, those trans series, uh, is the completely determined but the perturbative uh, theory that you have initially, which is this naive asymptotic series, which is expected. And what is also interesting on, 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 on that particular uh, aspect is that it has some consequences related with the fact that we don't need any longer the concept of being close to equilibrium because now I know how to perform a uh, a resume. I know that there is some terms that I didn't have initially, and those terms are purely non-perturbative. So those are like kind of messages that they start to emerge within the picture and the beautiful work done by uh, Heller and Espalinsky. So the details, as I said, I'm not going to um, explain them further. This is not the place, perhaps. But the really beautiful part of that is that uh, trans-series is a new concept that enters into the description of hydrodynamics. Now, uh, what it was also relevant was that uh, Paul Romatsky showed that this uh, behavior of having an attractor at late times happened not only in uh, Israel Stuart theory, of, he took different theories, they, this is a, a beer, beer, beer SSS theory, the Boltzmann equation itself, uh, and the ads CFT theory, which is just, uh, and each of them solve a very particular uh, set of equations. 
And as a function, again, of this uh, W variable, which is here explicitly written as tau times temperature. And he showed that regardless of the initial condition, each of those theories merges uniquely towards an, a, a line at very, very late times. And again, in the three of them, the late time asymptotic behavior, which is determined by those coefficients that emerge appear there, uh, describe perfectly uh, the late time asymptotic behavior of that line. And when you extrapolate to W equal to zero, uh, you get again the same, the same line. Uh, and this is again astonishing to me because uh, it tells me that regardless of the initial condition the, that you use, all of them merge uniquely towards a simple line. Now, the other aspect that uh, enters into that is that it's uh, independent of the coupling regime. So by that, it means something very, very, very uh, simple that I can either work in a very, very particular coupling like the ones in, invoked by ADS-EFT correspondence, which is infinite at least, uh, to the weekly ones, which is uh, what we believe Boltzmann equation does. And it doesn't matter in both, in all those cases, you observe an attractor. Furthermore, attractors can be determined, the, the late time attractors can be determined from very few terms of the gradient expansion. And they can be, after a resummation, extrapolated until very, very early times. And at the, the other part that I have very, very, uh, that is relevant to say is that uh, at the same time, when the hydrodynamic gradient expansion merges to the attractor, the system can be far, far from equilibrium. And by that, it means that large pressure and isotropies are present even when uh, the system is in hydrodynamical behavior. Furthermore, uh, it is important to emphasize that what it matters is the decay of those exponential terms that I mentioned before because those exponential terms are the ones that drive the system from a very, 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 very non-equilibrium situation towards a very, very, very close to equilibrium situation and therefore uh, close to the thermal equilibrium where hydrodynamics is supposed to work very, very, very well. And that means that uh, those exponential terms uh, do have a physical interpretation as a non-hydrodynamic modes because they drive the evolution from uh, far from equilibrium towards the late time hydrodynamical behavior, towards the late time hydrodynamical attractor. Now, Paul himself proposed the idea that uh, this is the existence of a new theory for far from equilibrium fluids. And therefore you can ask yourself, well, if uh, this theory exists, do we know something about their properties? Do we know something about what is really uh, happening there or some idea that provides us a picture based on the numerical evidence? And well, uh, that's where uh, different people, including myself, started to work and figure it out. And that's what I'm going to describe uh, starting now. But before of doing it, just let me remind you that uh, whether or not there is some experimental evidence that support this, and the answer is, well, we have some partial fluid-like behavior, uh, which has been measured in collisions of uh, small systems, like for instance, P gold collisions and, uh, so, sorry, proton, uh, proton gold collision and deuteron gold collisions in heavy, ion, in heavy ions. And this was precisely the result, and I am gonna focus right now in uh, what happens in the figure in the center, where you see uh, some, some of the uh, Fourier coefficients as a function of the transverse momenta, the experimental data compared with some predictions based in some of the hydrodynamic ab uh, models available in the market. And in all of them, again, you see a very good evidence that this happened. So why, there is, uh, why this can be taken as a hint of evidence? Because the typical size of uh, the proton compared with the gold after the collision and the amount of matter and deposited in those collisions is very small. And if the system is basically exploding and therefore 
you cannot expect that it's very, very close to uh, in equilibrium. You actually expect that it's actually farther away from equilibrium. So although this is just uh, an experimental result that we should take, we are still discussing these days in our field, it is relevant to say that it's just telling us like, hey, even if hydro works there, perhaps it's because we are not understanding some aspects of hydro. And one of the aspects that uh, it was really taken from the work on Hela and Spalinsky is precisely that hydro can be extended to regimes far from equilibrium. Okay, so let us go back to uh, the new type of expansion that was uh, uh, find out by uh, Heller and Spalinsky. And, <coughs> and again, so I am gonna write uh, like the solution of those uh, particular trend series that are recorded in those FK. And each of those functions that satisfy uh, that asymptotic uh, form satisfies something very interesting. First of all is that when the Nutzel number goes to zero, all those exponential terms uh, go away. And uh, those exponential terms that go away do not matter at late times and is expected because I said previously, I, I get the asymptotic perturbative expansion. E sub k, which in this case is just the leading order term as a sub k. The other aspect is that if you replace uh, that particular expression into the differential equation, what you ended up finding out is that that distribution, that, that particular function fk uh, can be written as a sort of renormalization group equation where this beta sub k is nothing else than a function of the Knudsen number, uh, f sub k, f sub k plus one, f sub k plus two, and so on. And this is nothing else than uh, uh, a renormalization group equation because it changes as a function of the uh, Knudsen number. So the Knudsen number plays the role, if you remember quantum field theory, of the, uh, how the, uh, how the uh, particular observable is changing as a function of the coupling constant. And what you have in the right-hand side is nothing else than uh, the beta function. In this case, there is a difference because uh, usually we don't have the uh, coupling constant emerging in the right-hand side, but only just the function itself. And in this case, it's just function also on fk, fk plus one, fk plus two, and so on. And this is just nothing else than a sort of dynamical RG flow structure, we call it in our work. And if you really take, for instance, what is the meaning of uh, one of the uh, FKs, in this, in this case, F sub one, and you take seriously the fact that the limit of uh, asymptotically is precisely the bare value of your uh, cheat over, cheat, uh, of your uh, transport coefficient, uh, which is the leading order term of your asymptotic gradient expansion, then you end up finding out that if you solve that equation just for F one, uh, that function has a very, very, very neat behavior. Uh, the, green, the, re, the black line just represents the uh, value when it's uh, asymptotical. In this case, we just tune some particular value. Doesn't matter what it is. And we tune for different initial conditions, C0 equal one, C0 equal 10, C0 equal uh, 100. And what you find there is nothing else than uh, that there is a transition from a very, 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 uh, that depends on the initial condition, of course. But it's just uh, telling me that there is a transition where the shear viscosity start to decrease and then it start to increase later on at late times. And if you take very, very seriously the idea that this function, the trans series itself, uh, carries out information about the decay of those uh, uh, non-hydrodynamical modes, then if you resume, the, if you resume them, they can give rise to the concept of a transport coefficient far from equilibrium. And this is kind of very new because it depends on the story of the fluid. And in this case, the rheology that is called, and this is a subject that is related with non-Newtonian fluid behavior. But in addition, there is a transient behavior between uh, where, as I said, the shear viscosity reduces. And in the rheology language, this means that it's a shear thinning 
And at light times, when the system in, and the interactions play a role among particles, is when there is like more collisions, then there is shear thickening. So this really, really, really um, <coughs> uh, tell us a little bit about an interpretation of this trend series based on a dynamical energy flow structure. Now, another aspect that uh, has been discussed in the literature is the fact that if you really analyze what happens with the uh, Fourier coefficients uh, as a function of the uh, transverse momentum in a heavy ion collision, then you find out that at low momenta they are increasing because the system may, is more and more uh, denser. And at higher momenta, when the particles fly faster outside of uh, whatever matter I create in the system, uh, then they, have, uh, they start to decrease. And uh, as far as my understanding the, uh, in this plot, the uh, large uh, uncertainty at large PT is some uh, experimental uh, statistical errors. But the interesting aspect is precisely that there is a transition between something that is very, 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 very like hydro, like a very, very, uh, let's call it like a dense in some extent, and something that is not related with hydro. And uh, one of the results that Paul found was precisely that uh, around trans, uh, energy scales uh, or transverse moment of the order of 2.5 GeV, um, hydrodynamics breaks down and he, said, well, there are other modes that enter into the description of the system. And those uh, new modes that you have, let me call it also non-hydro modes, which are dominant when hydro breaks down. Or in other words, we have a competition between hydro and non-hydro modes when we are very, very far from equilibrium. And this also we saw that because we have already something that is like very, very, very close to equilibrium, which is asymptotic expansion, and something that when it's very, very far from equilibrium, it was something else that is non-perturbable. In that case, the toy model that I showed. But here, it's more realistic related with data, so uh, let me just say that there are some other modes that enter into the description. So we took uh, this uh, approach uh, as, an, as, a, so, as a inspiration, and what we basically did was to analyze numerically what happens with uh, the deviation from equilibrium, so this delta f of the distribution function, and we just initialize uh, the dynamics by using the Boltzmann equation itself. Uh, what happens when the energy of the particle is on the order, for instance, of 2.5 GeV as a function of time? And here you have the plot, the green line is, uh, sorry, the black line is the exact result. And the deviations from equilibrium in general, when you do a, a typical asymptotic expansion, you just include one mode, which is the pi bar that I was discussing previously, which is uh, nothing else than the chief viscous tensor. But there might be some other modes that then exist there, which I'm going to consider non-hydrodynamic ones. And those other modes come when I analyze moments of the distribution function that couple with the shear via the dynamical equations of motion. And what it is found is that if you start to really wait uh, as a function of time, then uh, you see that there is better agreement between uh, this uh, uh, behavior of the distribution function as a function of time compared with I include only one mode. So the agreement is way, way much better. The deviation is because we just uh, include the uh, late time behavior. And what does it mean? Well, it means the following, that for intermediate scales of momenta, the variation of the distribution function requires not only one, as it is usually assumed, but two slowest non-hydrodynamical modes but in the soft, and which is related with hydro, and the semi-hard momentum sectors. The non-hydrodynamic transport approach, which is the dynamics of uh, non-hydro modes and hydro modes, is dominant in this intermediate regime in order to describe the system. And for instance, in collatum systems, pressure and isotropies, uh, for instance, that were, uh, have been considered as non-hydrodynamical degrees of freedom. So we don't know what is happening in collatums, but it's an idea that also can emerge in other fields. And what it is also interesting is that the asymptotic late time attractor of the distribution function itself does not depend only 
on the shear, but also on the other slowest non-hydrodynamic mode. And this is uh, very interesting because we don't know anything about any other modes that before. So to the best of my knowledge, this is one of the first examples that show precisely that uh, there are more than two modes at late times. And both of them uh, are connected and describe better the dynamics of the system. So this is also something that requires to be understanding. And for instance, in our field in, jet, uh, in uh, heavy ion collisions, I think that this might be very useful for a style subject quenching. And I know that other uh, folks uh, have also tried to address the issue that we do not know uh, many uh, of the aspects of other degrees of freedom entering in that particular regime. So this is just a toy model, but it's already a hint that something is going on and we can learn a lot about this. And okay, so this was uh, the case where uh, I was just analyzing. Uh, what happens with attractors in one dimension. But now we continue studying in the last years, and one of the aspects that uh, start to match is that attractors in higher dimensions are more difficult. And here I'm gonna take a toy model, which is uh, related with uh, the Gubser flow uh, for the Israel Stuart theory. The Gubser flow is nothing else than a system that expands in a very particular curved space. And uh, which uh, looks like the uh, initially one dimensional system that I was talking about, Bjorken, but it's much, much more complicated. And what we did was to study the uh, evolution of the variables as a function of uh, proper time. Here, tau t is the temperature, and here, p bar is exactly my shear viscous tensor over um, energy. And what we observed, what we did here was to solve the differential equation. Like you put it in mathematics, you solve it for the Israel Stuart theory. And then you let you just plot the solutions in the, in the phase space. And the first thing that you start to observe is that all the lines start to, some lines start to get out of, um, of some asymptotic behavior. So they basically blow away. But some other initial conditions start to merge asymptotically in a line. But if you see very carefully this three-dimensional plot, it's also telling us that when you have uh, attractors in, hydro, in, 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 the, in, differential, in higher dimensional equations, you cannot talk to, about having a unique line. You cannot talk about that because here is precisely the best example that I can show where there is no unique line. And this is uh, related with uh, the fact that there is no universal line during the intermediate stages at which I am uh, evolving. And there is also um, the fact, yeah? I cannot hear you. Um, go ahead. Yes, continue for now. Okay. Okay, so, uh, and uh, this particular uh, behavior it's just telling you that there is something different when we analyze attractors in higher dimensions. So the original idea that uh, was developed by Heller and others, which uh, inspired us a lot of ideas to think about. Uh, some, somebody's texting and I just got distracted. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. I'm just uh, controlling here. Okay, perfect. So the original idea that we have about having a unique line, which is attracting the rest, starts to uh, diffuse once you increase the, the dimensions or once you, you increase the, the, the difference between uh, what we observed before and now. And this can be seen very, very cleanly, clear as in here in this particular plot. Uh, the thing that is still truthful is that the late time asymptotic attractor exists and it looks like a line it looks like because all the uh, solution merged there, but it's not any longer flowing from the very beginning when tau goes to uh, minus one. The, the value of minus one is for the particular case that I'm studying here, which is this Gubser flow. So, uh, and this tells us also something else. In this particular case, is because the attractor is a 1D non-planar manifold, manifold because it's not a unique line, relate like what happens in the particular model that I showed before, which is called the Bjorken model. And 
in the Bjork and Gödel, you, what you see is a unique line, which is the uh, 1D planar curve, which is the line that I was showing before. But that does not exist, and again, I insist, does not exist in uh, the Israel Stuart theory. Okay, so <coughs> what is really more, more uh, concerning in this particular uh, study that we did is that the asymptotic behavior of the temperature or even the shear viscous, viscous, the shear viscous tensor is not necessarily determined by the knots and number. So, this, uh, so in this particular flow, which is a very, very uh, far from equilibrated system, uh, the asymptotic gradient expansion does not exist. It breaks down. And this was also observed by other authors, the Nicola Noronha. And basically what we are learning is that some flows can converge, yes, when asymptotically the system uh, kind of looks like in equilibrium, but some others might not. And in particular, attractors in higher dimension, it's not clear to me yet if in realistic situations, and this is something that we need to decide experimentally, uh, numerically, whether or not we can see this part, this type of behavior. Uh, related with the fact that the knots and number is broken or not. However, uh, this is an example where this doesn't happen, and it gives us some lessons to think about what it means to have fluid hydrodynamics in far from equilibrium situations. All right. <clears throat> All right, so, uh, well, it was fast. So now let me just uh, flash out some ideas uh, about what I think is the future of, the, of, of uh, fluid dynamics out of equilibrium. Of course, this is a very subjective um, interpretation of facts. Uh, so I may leave out some other uh, aspects. And one of them is precisely uh, emergence of liquid-like behavior in systems and extreme conditions. For instance, uh, what happens in neutron star mergers? Are we having large knots and numbers when we really couple uh, the um, hydro equations together with the GR equations and what are the conditions there. I think that uh, there is a lot of uh, interesting work to do in cosmology too, in other applications that uh, people use frequently to uh, study uh, cosmological and inflation models, for instance. What about uh, chiral effects in nuclear and condensed matter systems? There have been some other interesting aspects of attractors, uh, especially at early times where uh, the behavior is less understood, although in recent years, uh, different people have been uh, working around, for instance, not only us, but also Urs Biedemann and his collaborators, and Ulrich Heinz and his collaborators. Um, uh, also, there was a very interesting work last year about entropy production and experiments by Giacalloni, Maselia Uskas et al, where they try to understand how the emergence of this uh, universal attractor can tell us something about the entropy produced uh, in heavy ion collisions. Uh, last month, if I'm correct, there was a very interesting paper uh, related with uh, understanding higher dimensional attractors in the phase space, as I uh, mentioned before, via machine learning. Uh, this was done again for the Bjorken model, but it will be very interesting to see what happens with uh, uh, when you have uh, more realistic situations. And they, uh, according with the paper, you can use uh, partial component analysis to understand it. You can also uh, address aspects related with the fact that uh, attractors far from equilibrium have certain scaling behavior. And uh, there was work about Vasilia uh, Uskas and Vergas last year Raju Gopalan and his collaborators have worked on that for years to try to understand this from other perspective, more field theory approach, and also Francois Gelis. And okay, uh, so with this, I conclude my talk. So uh, hydrodynamics uh, continue being a 200 year old theory, which uh, is one of the most active research subjects in physics, chemistry, biology, and others. And after 200 years, we still have surprises. Uh, the emergence of liquid-like behavior is uh, observed in a large variety of systems, and therefore uh, it requires an explanation like how those systems that are to extreme conditions uh, behave like a fluid. 
And for that, we need to better ideas to formulate a universal fluid dynamics for power equilibrium systems. And more importantly, it is necessarily to uh, test these ideas with uh, experiments in order to learn better. And some of the work, as I mentioned previously, have been already gone, done by uh, Alexis Maseliauskas and others. And I forgot to mention that also there is a room for coal atom systems, and uh, there have been work from other authors trying to uh, quantify effects of um, non-hydrodynamic modes in the evolution of uh, those particular systems by tuning certain uh, particular configurations. All right, so uh, I conclude uh, my talk. It went faster than I Thank thought. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a beautiful talk at times mind-blowing. Any questions from the audience, please? Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, please, Giorgio, go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Perfect. Um, thank you very much. It was a beautiful talk, but I just want to say that I am very skeptical that most of the stuff you said has anything to do with the real world and heavy ion experiments. Oh, Giorgio, um, come on. <laughs> for two reasons. The first one is that it's kind of, you derive the hydrodynamics from the Boltzmann equation, like the Boltzmann equation is the theory of everything. But it isn't. And in fact, the approximations that go into the Boltzmann equation, like molecular chaos, should break down exactly in small systems, should break down exactly in small systems. I might believe that, I might believe that um, hydrodynamics works in a system of 50 particles because of some complicated, very strong correlations within the system. But I'll never, ever, ever believe that the Boltzmann equation works on it because 20 particles will, correlations will not wash away uh, on a short time scale. I mean, fluc thermal fluctuations should give you a hydrodynamic response. And with 20 particles, thermal fluctuations are definitely not negligible. The second reason, and it's related, is that if you use one dimension or you impose enormous symmetry like Gupser flow, um, you might have an attractor because there is a lot of instabilities that you're washing away. The biggest instability of hydrodynamics known since the 19th century is that vortices Turbulence, I mean, you mentioned turbulence in one of your slides, but what drives turbulence and what, for example, is responsible for turbulence being different in two and three dimensions is vortices. You don't have any vortices in neither Bjorken flow or in Gupser flow, if I remember correctly. So I would be very, very careful at relating these exercises in one dimension um, from the Boltzmann equation to experimental, to the mysteries from which experiments is driving us. This is sort of just my comment. Okay, thank you, Giorgio. Please, Maurice. Well, uh, this talk was not necessarily related with um, experiments. So it's uh, clear that uh, here I was addressing uh, some of the recent uh, theoretical developments to, uh, un to understand some hints that we have seen in experiments. So these, uh, these uh, issues are making us think like, what, are, what is wrong in the foundations of hydrodynamics that we always believe were already established? Uh, that's my first comment uh, in general. And I use kinetic theory as a setup to illustrate how those ideas, new ideas start merge in toy models. So you can say, yes, those are toy models. And I acknowledge and I accept the critic. Uh, however, uh, when we do theory, you know that we start to do models. And sooner than later, when we start to do um, more phenomenology, we will realize that, OK, uh, those toy models are not any longer uh, what we wanted. So th they are more and more complicated when we apply to reality. And that's where we have to change. And we are going to learn much more. Uh, for instance, uh, there is a still interesting work that uh, has been done by uh, Romachke, uh, by other uh, 
uh, about this non-hydro uh, transfer, and not only Romatsky, but also other authors, also Urs Biedemann, also, uh, I don't remember other authors, so I for, for, forgive me for that if I don't mention you, where they say like, okay, well, let's try to analyze what happens in high PT and intermediate uh, regions of, of, of um, uh, momentum. And we start to learn from that. So remember that we do in heavy ions these models and we learn from them. That's, that's the best uh, that we can do, right? And now I still see that there is a lot of value in those studies because before, at least uh, 10 years when I was starting my PhD, I always, always everybody was using the same and telling me the same, like, oh, all this established, you start from there. Now we can forget about that a little bit. And we can start to build up new tools new approaches to these problems that are very hard and try to uh, constrain them too. Uh, I know that uh, there are some ongoing works of other friends of mine who also are thinking in this problem. So I am always positive uh, that those ideas might lead us to think about the bigger picture. And we are learning by doing certain calculations and of course, the more general, the better. Uh, that's why when I start to do the groups, and not only me, but others, it was more with relate with having in mind like what is what we can learn in this setup that was not that maybe wasn't hidden in the previous one that were studied which was Bjork. So uh, I don't know what else I can tell you about that about your comment Let, but that's my opinion. Go to the next question. Uh, you you tried you tried to answer that as fully as you could and I think it's appreciated. So let's go to Kirill. Kirill Wasowski please unmute yourself. Hello, hi. Yeah, hi. It was a great talk, really. It, it, was, it was a great pleasure listening to that. Thank and you. I, had, I had a question about uh, shear viscosity and transfer coefficients far from equilibrium, basically. So you have defined, you, you said that, that there is, uh, that you have defined basically shear viscosity far from equilibrium in terms of uh, F11 or Yes, some... it's a, tra a trans series. Let me, let me just... Yes, and, and this is interesting because, uh, for instance, um, you, you can also uh, define a shear viscosity in terms of really just usual, usual, usual gradient expansion. And uh, then you have the same structure like in thermal equilibrium or close to thermal equilibrium, but just the, the coefficient is time dependent. And you also have a time dependent coefficient yes. here. But uh, yeah. it's a completely different, so the structure looks a completely different thing. It's, it's a series here in your case uh, with, some a, with some coefficients AK and in Knudsen numbers, which mm -hmm. is probably gradient expansion. So mm -hmm. my question is, is this the same way, um, for instance, also Alexis and Jürgen have defined their shear viscosity, or do you know of other ways to I, define shear viscosity far from equilibrium. Uh, uh, I, I know that some other authors have used uh, some particular definition. Just to answer your question, uh, you can calculate using, uh, as you said, in kinetic theory, there is a precise way to calculate the shear viscosity via chapman enskun expansion, gradient expansion of the distribution function itself. And one of the exercises that we did, and that's why I, that was that I, I can tell you, because it's one of the best nights of my life when we identify that what we calculate with linear response theory was giving us exactly the same asymptotic limit of the transidious, exactly the same number. So that correspondence exists and is encoded automatically by dynamical means by this transidious. And it's because I built from the very beginning, my transidious needs to know what happens asymptotically when the system is perturbative. And when I solve it, and I am telling you really uh, that I really calculate that object by using the usual chapman enskun expansion gradients and I separate each term and blah, blah, blah. And then I got exactly the same numbers that I get by taking the asymptotic limit of the transitive. So the correspondence exists and what I'm just actually telling is even better that I can really generalize all the expansion of the distribution function. And I get for free the asymptotic uh, chapman enskog expansion that we know in terms of gradient. So, so which means that uh, you, as a, so asymptotic in the sense of late times, that you see yes. that it, it corresponds to, uh, to the actual, uh, well, to the actual structure of hydrodynamic equations. But yes. 
but do the uh, do does the structure of the hydrodynamic equations also I mean, I mean only the structure of the equations does it also look the same uh, in your expansion in your far from for far from equilibrium expansion as compared again at finite times as compared to the thermal one to the to to the usual asymptotic one so 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 not not only in the asymptotic limit that those coefficients go to the right co coefficients basically but okay. also that the structure remains the same far from equilibrium uh let me see if I understand. So the way that I construct those trend series is by finding order by order mm -hmm. the form from the uh, asymptotic expansion that I have originally. And by doing this, I already encode this asymptotic behavior. I don't need to do anything else. The asymptotic behavior already tells me how all those non-perturbative terms emerge and how I can resume them. Mm -hmm. uh, so by doing this, I already encode all that information, and then if I and, and now what I do is generalize my gradient expansion of my gra of, of my uh, hydrodynamical fields in terms of trans series, which asymptotically merge by construction to what I do when I do the gradient expansion. I don't know if that... I think I think we're getting mm -hmm. into sort of some technical details that might be okay. uh, better to sort out offline. So if, if you want, I can just explain you in an email, maybe. I know, I know who you are. I, I, yeah, this we, we could discuss yeah. it later, but I think I, I, I grasp what, what you mean. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next in line is uh, Mauricio Suarez. So please unmute yourself and uh, speak. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you to Mauricio for the talk. Um, my question is related to numerical methods exactly to solving attractors. So, uh, Mauricio, which kind of numerical methods are the ideal ones in order to deal with them, with the attractors? Well, you have to study all... Attractors is always related with asymptotics, and that's why uh, the example that we did is a very good question. Uh, the, the example that we did was nothing else than what happens in attractors in higher dimension. So uh, my best uh, approach right now is that we need to generalize the recent work uh, of uh, uh, Heller and all uh, by using uh, machine learning techniques and compare with the solutions, the numerical solutions that you have from your hydro solver. And they can help you to determine how the uh, attractor of a very higher dimensional system, like for instance in 2 plus 1, 3 plus 1, or anything you want, uh, how does it behave? Because it's not really easy to identify them uh, when you have a higher dimensional system. And this is one of the examples that we learned the lesson uh, about how to do that. Uh, and the methods that you need to do in, in, in your numerical simulations, well, that depends on uh, which person you ask. But I am more interested in is how to uh, use those numerical solutions to identify the attractors. And that's where I think that those machine learning techniques provide a very, very uh, powerful tool. I don't know the details yet of the, of the numerics involved in that, uh, in the work of uh, Spaliski and Heller. But at least I know when I read the paper, uh, the, the generic idea is very appealing and it's very interesting to merge both things together in order to identify attractors. So I think that uh, we need to combine both, not only what we know already about solving numeric, uh, very complicated numerical simulations, but also let's use those machine learning tools to identify attractors and quantify the properties asymptotically. That's the best answer I can tell you right now, but it's a very good question. Uh, I think that it will remain open for a while, at least in practical terms. It's Sounds a very good, good question. Thank you. So the next question, Ho Yi, please. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, so I want to understand better uh, some of this uh, validity regime of the this universal theory out of equilibrium you are thinking of. So if I understand uh, correctly, uh, when Kuno's number is much, much larger than one, then eventually the theory should become microscopic theory, I guess. And then it's obvious that microscopic theory is not universal. 
on the other hand, you kind of uh, seem to suggest that there is some evidence of some universal theory out of equilibrium uh, when the Knuth number is uh, order one or greater. So, so I'm asking uh, what kind of range of Knuth number you would expect this, uh, for this universal theory to be valid before entering a really microscopic non-universal regime. Uh, would my question make sense to you? Yes, uh, maybe I have use of the word universal because uh, uh, and I apologize for that if that, uh, I, I send that mistake. What I mean is that uh, in the uh, work of Paul, that uh, it, when we, he showed that regardless of what kind of, of theory you have, you have a attractor for each particular theory. And the idea of the attractor, the existence of an attractor, uh, and the fact that uh, the asymptotic expansions can be um, merged towards my attractor, even when the Knudsen number is, is, is very large, what is universal is precisely the, that the existence of that attractor, that the attractor seems to be a universal property of all those systems. And that fact by itself tells us that there should be some theory that tells us how to resume, because I, I also indicate that, uh, and thanks to the work of, of uh, uh, Michal and, and, and Espalinsky, um, I, I also said that uh, there should be a way, a systematic way, to perform those resumations in such a way that we can really extrapolate hydrodynamics well, well, well beyond uh, the regime. So that's what I meant by. Uh, that that should be a new theory. I may have not used the word universal, uh, but I think that um, what I mean by universal is the fact that, that there should be some attractor and that attractor is a non-equilibrated one that can be asymptotically described by the asymptotic gradient expansion that we are used in uh, general in hydrodynamics. I hope that I answered my question correctly. Uh, so, so that, uh, so, so, uh... Um, with what cross number would you expect that theory to actually uh, make transition to really microscopic theory, which is clearly non-universal? Do we have some uh, yeah, the, the non Yes, the non-universality. Some people have this interpretation. I, I have my opinion about that. But, uh, and so people say that the non-universality is what happens when um, it's at very, very early times. Uh, however, recent works have shown like what happens at early times is the, in the Bjorken case, is the existence of a, now I have to start to be a little bit more careful with the works of a pullback attractor, um, which uh, we also indicate. Um, but uh, I think that what is universal is the existence of a theory and the existence of an attractor. Uh, what not a number? I don't have an idea because hydrodynamics is always an effective theory. However, if I use the same equations of motion that I have, uh, I found out like uh, not some number can be large and hydro can be applicable. Uh, but when it breaks down, the best example was done by also by Paul Romachke, who shows that uh, for heavy ion collisions at PT on the order of 2.5, it breaks down. And above that, there are some non-hydrodynamical uh, behavior that needs to be understood. But I cannot tell you, uh, that is perhaps the best answer, or the most quantitative one, uh, if you are looking for a number. Uh, but I cannot tell you exactly when and where. I don't have yet an idea, and I hope that I can give you that answer at some point. Okay. So can I interpret your answer by saying that uh, uh, there is some intermediate regime uh, beyond hydro, yes. but before going into microscopic theory, there is some universal regime where there is a new kind of theory uh, might exist. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I would say so. Okay. I think yeah. it's very optimistic, but yes, I think that's the message. <laughs> yeah, I see. Yeah, yes. Thanks a lot, Marisha. Yeah. Okay, uh, we have at least one more question. Uh, please, Mark Alkakani. So hi. Yourself. Hi. Yeah, hi. Hi. It was a great, uh, great talk, uh, really. 
Thank so you. my question is uh, still related maybe to the first comment about the experiment and the attractors. So I know attractors are important to understand the validity of hydrodynamics. That's clear. But you said in the conclusions that this is somehow needs to be um, related to experiment. And this is, you know, still not clear to me. Um, do you mean some observables will be sensitive to that? So it will tell us something about uh, maybe attractors or I didn't know how experiment gets in there. Well, uh, there have been, to the best of my knowledge, at least in my field, uh, very few works that uh, have shown that there is the potential to understand, uh, for instance, uh, what I was showing here. Let me just go a little bit further. Okay, sorry. Um, the work of uh, Paul, again. So where uh, he showed that precisely that there is this uh, transition where the VNs increase and that is very well described by hydro, but eventually hydro breaks down. And then uh, there is also this uh, other region that um, where the uh, system is more dilute because you have particles with high energy and therefore uh, something is happening there to make these VNs to go uh, to reduce the, the value which is basically the system becomes more dilute, so nothing is happening. But still the transition is very interesting to understand. Uh, I, I do not have an explanation for that. If somebody can send me an article about that, that will be highly appreciated. But when I write this, this article, uh, the idea that there might be something that we do not understand in the, in the, in the decay of uh, the energy tails, so for instance, the distribution function, that can have relation with the experiment. But uh, I think that we do not understand yet at, that po at this point, uh, that aspect. I feel that also the work of uh, Alexis and uh, others show that uh, the entropy that you can produce between the, the initial and final entropy uh, can be explained, can be at, at least uh, the, the scaling can be the, between both of them can be understood in terms of this transition between pre-equilibrium and, and, and let's call it like that, <laughs> close to equilibrium. And that is related with uh, the existence of attractor. Uh, they, they use the attractor idea in order to understand that the scaling between the initial and final entropy, which is related with the initial and final multiplicities, if you think about uh, experimental observables. So I, I would say, and I'm very, very cautious about that, that there is a potential to understand something deeper uh, if we just combine theory and experiment. And I feel that some works have already pointed out like, yes, there is that possibility to understand some of those features uh, by using those ideas. But still, we are far away to have a concrete answer. And by a concrete answer, I mean a numerical algorithm or something like that. So I, I, that part, I don't think that we are yet at this stage, but we are building up the what we expect at least, or what we want to expect up to some extent. And we just need to start to do phenomenology in that direction and work on that direction is, is being done really. But uh, I cannot tell you exactly when. Okay, I think that that basically tells you, this is work in progress. It's all work in progress. We are having this to have some new ideas and uh, basically to have some stimulating discussions like we have. Uh, I don't see there are any more questions, so I guess I want to use this opportunity to thank again our speaker, Mauricio. Uh, that was indeed a very, very good talk. I hope everybody enjoyed. Uh, stay tuned. We will have this colloquia every week. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation, and thanks for everybody to be here. And if you have something to say, just send me an email.